get this talk started. So I hope you guys have had a really great day so far. We've got one more great speaker for you. Uh, this is Amber Balde. Uh, she's the co-founder of Clover. And I'll let her speak. Hi. How's everyone's day so far? Woohoo! Um, so I realize that I am the last thing between you and networking drinks and all of these other wonderful things. So I believe we have about 30 minutes. Um, I was asked to set a bit of a context and kind of take a bit of a higher view to put a capstone on the day and think about these like larger themes of um, what the next 10 years means. Um, and so, uh, you know, I figure, what the hell, here are my 10-year uh, Bitcoin predictions, hot off the presses, here you go, hot takes, immediately should be posted to Twitter. Here we go. So they're going to be very insightful, I promise. Regulators are going to do something, it's going to be encouraging. People are going to get excited about it. <laughs> um, regulators then are going to do something that is discouraging. People are going to get angry about it. Uh, Coinbase is going to list something. <laughs> People, going to get excited about it. Uh, Coinbase is going to acquire something. People are going to get angry about it. Uh, Blockstream, launch more satellites. People, obviously, excited about it. Bitcoin in space. Uh, Blockstream will launch some other products. People will get angry about it. You're seeing a theme here. Um, our Bitcoin is going to censor something. People will get angry. Uh, these people are going to say some stuff. <laughs> you can pick, pick which one you feel. People are going to get angry about it. And eventually, the number of Bitcoin podcasts and channels will exceed the number of circulating Bitcoin, <laughs> at which point people everywhere will be very, very angry, and there will be no one left to actually watch said podcasts. Uh, and finally, Brock Pierce will transcend the physical plane, of course. So thank you. Nailed it. Anyway, I don't know. And anyone else who tries to tell you that they know exactly where Bitcoin is going to be in 10 years is trying to sell you something, and we should shun them. So history does not repeat itself, but it rhymes. And what I mean by this is that we don't have a crystal ball to see what the future looks like, but we can look at how we got here and draw some interesting comparisons. Um, so let's go all the way back to 1972. It was a good time. There's Jane Fonda out there in Hanoi. You got the Sex Pistols, uh, Noam Chomsky protesting uh, MIT, doing research into war, uh, war weapons. Uh, so good year. Godfather came out, right? Um, so it was also, uh, you probably recall that it was slightly before that in 1969 when ARPANET was created. Um, and creating the first kind of packet switch networks uh, back then. And there, this was not the only network to do so, right? IBM was another uh, large leader in the space. Uh, GE and GM, there were business consortiums that were coming together to try to define their own protocols to link their machines together. Uh, and there were a lot of competing standards. Um, it wasn't so much they were permissioned networks as much as that no one else knew that they were there or how to get into them. But they realized at some point that there needed to be interoperable standards if machines were going to speak to each other, and we are going to be able to especially send things like financial wires around the world. And so it was in 1972 that Vince Cerf was appointed to chair this international network working group, uh, which, at which point I realized that uh, in, in the last number of years, we have not come up with better ways to name our working groups. Um, and he was tasked with figuring out what these kind of protocols should look like in a consortium that really spanned the globe. Um, and there were different models. The incumbents, especially the telcos, wanted to have a virtual switching system that looked a lot like the existing circuit system from the telephone system. And uh, Vince Cerf was a proponent of, uh, of another type of design uh, that was based off of what you can see Hans, uh, uh, Hans Zimmerman, Zimmerman up there. Um, he's explaining, again, going back to a long history of men with beards explaining things to men in suits about computers that they don't necessarily understand. He was explaining to them this kind of different kind of connectionless datagram that became what is now known as TCP IP. But there was a long road to get there. Uh, IBM took its, its uh, what was called the systems network architecture at the time that it was using internally and really pr uh, proposed that as being the thing that the world should standardize around. This became what was known as OSI, the Open Systems Interconnection uh, System. We still use these kind of layers to talk about application architecture. But what they were talking about wasn't just the OSI layer cake that we learn in computer science, but about the kind of rigidly defined protocols within each layer that would allow these 
noise machines to talk to each other. And so there was a large number of committees and working groups and discussions around the world about this, and it turned out to be very cumbersome. And you also had to pay to get access to the designs. Meanwhile, TCPIP was somewhat lightweight, didn't solve all the problems necessarily, and looked radically different from things. But what you ended up with, and this is from a 1994 uh, issue of Networking World, is responses eventually saying things like, OSI is an overblown, bloated, everything to everybody protocol that does nothing particularly well. TCP IP, on the other hand, has been designed to work from day one. It was designed, implemented, redesigned, and refined in the context of a real network environment, not a bureaucratic vacuum of people who are concerned with stuffing every possible feature into a protocol and then making a protocol that is impenetrable in a practical sense. Now, I don't know if you've participated in any sort of enterprise consortia around the sort of blockchains that we're looking at today, but I feel extremely called out by this. <laughs> um, and so it, it turns out that OSI was actually more open and decentralized, whereas TCP IP um, was spearheaded in a more of a closed fashion. It was a smaller group of direct participants writing the code and that used it. Uh, but when ARPANET flipped over to it, it ended up becoming what the, the internet became, right? And so it's not necessarily a direct analog, but it does say something uh, about kind of where we're at today, I think. So let's flash forward to 1998. 1998, this was a good year. This was a good year. I mean, we had Buffy, we had X-Files, you got Pi coming out, Big Lebowski, we'll skip over the Spice Girls. But you had Prodigy, I mean, Lauren Hill, this was, this was a great year, right? Okay. Um, maybe a low point of 1998, the DMCA was enacted. So a unanimous Senate vote. When was the last time the Senate did anything unanimously? Right? And I'm sure we're all familiar with the DMCA criminalizing, uh, making, uh, it criminalizes making, distributing, or using anything that circumvents DRM, or digital rights management. Right? It also makes it illegal to decrypt some types of software uh, and to mess around with stuff generally. And also, by Title V, it adds special protection for boat hull designs which generally are not contained under copyright, because I'm sure lobbying had nothing to do with any of this. OK, so one thing is that every three years, the exemptions to the DMCA are re-reviewed. And they're re-reviewed because people knew at the time that this law was fuzzy and wasn't going to make a lot of sense as the technology evolved. And so over time, we've had to do things like make sure that um, audiobook readers can actually read the software that, of the books that they're supposed to read, uh, read, that as phones took over, that wireless handsets could connect to things, that security researchers are allowed to actually do their job without getting arrested at hacker conferences. Or that you know, um, farm workers are able to repair their, uh, their agricultural vehicles. The right to repair has been hotly contested. And as it is right now, you can repair your vehicle, but you cannot um, mess with the entertainment system on it. So you can see that the, there's a lot of corporate interests behind how this copyright law is enacted at a very technical level. And it has to, it's right at this convergence of monetary interests and actual cryptography. right? So, shout out, thanks to the EFF, they, uh, woo, shout out for the EFF. Um, they fight this fight every three years, they're not the only ones, but they, they do do a lot of work in the space. Uh, we can gloss over things like SOPA PIPA, but again, making it much harder uh, to do intellectual, um, or to handle copyright on the internet. And eventually what we have is a bunch of business concerns that resulted uh, in the entertainment industry thinking like, stuff gets copied, we're going away. Our industry is under existential threat here. What are we going to do? Um, and now there, there was this idea of, what if we could license these things? Streaming became compatible. And eventually, uh, the, in, the industry kind of caved, right? It's like, well, we need to explore this new business model, this new distribution model. And so we've had this centralization of media. And it's because DRM is in, an intractable problem. That's why we're going to put it on the blockchain now. And I'm sure now we'll fix it. It'll be fine. No problem. It's not, it doesn't work that way. Uh, net neutrality on top of that. You had this collapsing of internet traffic to a small number of, uh, of websites. And so it became more efficient if we could give those people more space on the lanes, right? We'll just move everybody else to the side. And so now you have net neutrality fights going on. Um, when I said apathy in the title of this, I didn't necessarily want to get down on regular people who don't have time to deal with technology all the time. Um, but I think what we're seeing here is that you know, we're, we're living in kind of a post-net neutrality world right now. And like things aren't on fire. And so people tend to think that maybe it's OK. Um, but it, you know, it's, it's really over a matter of time and little by little that the, the real changes would be seen here. It's like the frog boiling. 
And finally, so dual use of technology and export controls. Um, so pre-1975, cryptography was considered a munition. Like straight up, it was not uh, able to be exported from this country, and it was really only thought to have military applications. Uh, it wasn't until banks started wanting to use DES encryption to secure their wire transfers that, uh, that there was lobbying pressure on regulators to make them say, actually, we need to think about this a little bit differently. Maybe this has commercial applications too. And then uh, PGP came out in 91, and all of a sudden, uh, encryption was within the grasp of regular individuals, and strong encryption at that, right? Uh, so now you started to get things like the government saying, uh-oh, strong encryption sounds kind of scary. Maybe we should be uh, backdooring these things to make sure that the good guys still have access. So the clipper chip was introduced in 93. It kind of gets rolled out and dies by 96. Uh, there's kind of an ongoing process of regulatory uh, engagement in this cryptography space. And it's still ongoing, right? So um, Australia Australia recently uh, enacted a, a backdoor uh, law. You know, after the the um, San Bernardino shooting, there was the the um, issue with the iPhone and the secure enclave and all of this. So this is an ongoing challenge. And in looking at things in these kind of 10-year horizons, we miss the fact that it really goes back decades at this point, uh, and that this has been part of um, our human rights, but also our national security infrastructure and our commercial infrastructure for decades, and it's not changing. So. Law enforcement is in unanimous agreement that the widespread use of robust non-key recovery encryption ultimately will devastate our ability to fight crime and prevent terrorism. Untrackable encryption uh, will allow drug lords, spies, terrorists, and even violent gangs to communicate about their crimes and conspiracies with impunity. We will lose one of the few remaining vulnerabilities of the worst cr criminals and terrorists upon which law enforcement depends to successfully investigate and often prevent the worst crimes. Who do, who do we think said that? It was the FBI director in 1997. So these were their concerns in 1997. Okay, so what I know is that not a week goes by where I don't encounter across all our programs a significant insurmountable impediment with encrypted devices and encrypted messaging platforms. Just as the technology has become a force multiplier for the good guys, it has become a force multiplier for the bad guys. I get a little frustrated when people say that we're trying to weaken encryption. We believe in strong encryption, but we're also duty bound to protect the American people. I would love to see people try to come together and work towards solutions. I'm hearing there are solutions to be had. So who do you think said this one? This would be our FBI director at RSA last week. So you can see that slightly the tone has changed because now this is a PR issue, but the, the want remains. They really want the golden keys. Okay, so let's go step back a second. We're gonna fork off into 2016 again. 2016 was a trash fire year. I'm pretty sure we can all agree, agree on that. I mean, maybe you had Beyonce and Pokemon as like highlights, but we lost all of our wizards. I don't know what all those white people are doing. Taylor Swift is apparently Anna Winter now. I don't know. It was a, it was a friggin' mess. Okay. So, but we had the whole Cambridge Analytica scandal. We don't need to rehash that. I'm sure everybody here is quite familiar with that. But the point being that this was not a data breach. This was business operating as planned. This was a business model. And it happened in 2016. But Facebook has been having some issues for the decade prior to that. So, I mean, they came out really in 2006. And that year when they introduced the news feed, they said, uh, well, we can always do better when people were very surprised that their friends, posts for their friends were shared with everyone else. Just kind of go across the top. There's too many of these to really show. But, you know, when user accounts couldn't be deleted, the New York Times discovered that and they said, just delete it all manually. Just go in and click that, no problem. Um, when there was a user ID leak, they said, these reports were exaggerated. We will definitely add new safeguards. The real name policies, which were terrible for vulnerable populations, um, they thought that authentic identity is important to the Facebook experience. Uh, in 2014, they had that data science experiment. Remember when they were trying to get people angry or happy by figuring out how they filter the news in their feed? I can understand why some people might have concerns about it. Uh, and then in 2016, to this point, uh, the investigations into the election manipulation, we were not prepared but we've learned a lot since then. Thanks. Um, and as we are now, uh, in 20, well, coming out of uh, 2019, we have now privacy-focused Facebook announced. So I'm sure it's going to be different this time. But 
the thing is that they do have to assess these trade-offs, right? There's not, this is one of those few situations where when you say there are good people on both sides, there really are. Uh, it's not just about having a single set of morals or ethics that somehow are going to decide this, but figuring out how we as a society manage to retain individual rights and human rights and, and democratic rights, but also pr have generalized protection and are able to engage as a society with people outside of our borders and around the world as well. So there are always these trade-offs, and these trade-offs are not going to go away. Uh, so it's a problem. Sometimes really important stuff disappears from the web, like, say, all of the EPA's data sets when there's an administration change. Kind of wish that didn't go away. But you know what? Sometimes really terrible stuff will not disappear from the web. Revenge porn, for example. Or maybe all of the works of Iggy Azalea. I don't know, but <laughs> not my problem. Uh, so we come to around September of 2018, and I thought, um, if you're not following Alex Stamos, who's the former uh, chief security officer of Facebook, uh, and is, is not now former, he's former, right? Um, he's uh, fantastic and a, a good person. Um, but he's saying that I think it's easy to underestimate how radical what uh, WhatsApp decision to deploy end-to-end -end encryption was. Acton and Coombe, who are the founders of WhatsApp, uh, with Zuck's blessing, had jumped off this bridge with the goal of building a monetization parachute on the way down. So we have this collision, again, of what is the business interest, what is the business model for privacy, what are our legal obligations, and what is it that users really want? How do you drive engagement? How do we make people feel like they have their own personalized experience while uh, still managing to keep thing, things private and make them feel safe? And is a feeling of safety the same as real safety? And now after this privacy thing was announced um, a couple, last week or whatever, he said, uh, I imagine each of these trade-offs as a dial on the front of a guitar amp, and for years Facebook has tried to t tweak each thing between three and eight, and so if you take this recent post at face value, he's going to slam a bunch of these dials to one or eleven. And so if you look at this, I mean, nobody has better insight into the strategic uh, security footprint of Facebook than Alex, probably. And he doesn't really know what this is going to look like in 10 years either. The landscape is changing all the time. And it could be, you know, this Facebook coin thing could be systemically important. So who knows? So what does this all mean? Well. Uh, the blog and the book, You Are Not So Smart, is fantastic. Uh, if, if you haven't read them, I recommend them. Uh, it's all about how humans are really, really bad at making statistical judgments. Uh, we apply a whole variety of heuristics, and most of the time we are wrong, like dramatically wrong, right? So time is what keeps everything from happening at once. I like this. It's so true. 50% of people are below average. It's a good one. OK. so. Here we go. Here's time. Blockchain. This is the Google search results or, uh, for the search term of blockchain. And you can see, obviously, when we had peak blockchain hype. It's a very exciting time. Well, I have some good news and I have some bad news. Blockchain is still blue. Red is Pirate Bay. Uh, now, of course, the overall amount of absolute traffic has gone up over time, but the relative search frequency uh, is, is what's measured here, right? Um, and so in the middle, you can see that at some point, Pirate Bay had a much higher percentage of the, the social consciousness of the people that were online at that time. And now, in absolute terms, it's tracking just about exactly the same as the word blockchain. Now, if you add BitTorrent to that, which is you know, the, the protocol equivalent that's a less productized version of what Pirate Bay was able to provide to people, you can see that as Pirate Bay was able to make things usable and accessible, people decided that that's what they were actually looking for. Although early on, there was an even higher amount of interest amongst people online in the BitTorrent protocol. Bitcoin Act. OK, so there's Bitcoin. <laughs> Uh, and you can see, wow, that's what a bubble looks like. Pretty exciting times. Uh, and that obviously dwarfed absolutely everything before it because regular people were searching for what is Bitcoin. But if you look at something like Netflix, it's simply tracking at a growing engagement rate for normal people that entire time. And it is, uh, it is eating the lunch of the file sharing services, and it's getting new organic traffic and growth from people who never would have engaged in those services to begin with, right? Most people don't want to violate copyright. 
And so we can kind of draw some conclusions from this, but mostly it's about our myopia. And the idea that if we sit on crypto Twitter and you think that everybody else is thinking about these things that you are, you're wrong. So we've talked a little bit about a whole bunch of different things. This is a big timeline of 50 years from, from 1969 to 2019. Um, and it's kind of mixed together. I literally, I cherry picked this list of things that were, I thought were interesting, like pretty much just one thing from each year. But you can see it's kind of all mixed together, right? Like it is this kind of continuous timeline that we have this hindsight bias and this survivorship bias that makes it look like it's a timeline that makes sense. It makes it look like there's some direct line between the things that happened in the 70s and the way that the internet is today. But it's simply not true. Um, John Perry Bar, this is from Slate, John Perry Barlow's distaste for regulation combined with an early sense that the internet would change the world and thus should be defended from the government by the people who use it likely helped to lay the groundwork for the unhinged growth of the corporate walled gardens that we have today. Places where journalism has gotten lost in the weeds of fake news and new startups have diminishing chances of competing. What if the pioneers of the open web had given us a different vision, one that paired, uh, that paired the insistence that we must defend cyberspace with a concern for justice, human rights, and open creativity, not primarily personal liberty? What kind of internet would we have today? The thing is that we run the risk of always fighting yesterday's war. And John Pyre Barlow was certainly a visionary and obviously a philosophical leader for a lot of what we're doing today. But he was concerned with the government overreach coming out of things like the Cold War and the Vietnam War and didn't foresee the rise of the corporate structures that we have today. So what are we doing that is simply reactive to the current political and commercial state that's completely turning a blind eye to the way that these, these networks are going to emerge and the kind of emergent architecture and, and holistic change that we're seeing? Um, we're starting to hear a little bit more talk in information security circles about instead of just threat modeling, also doing abuse modeling. And that, that's, uh, that means looking at how these systems, even when they're functioning as designed, are operating in more of a gray area where you get these unintended outcomes because there's so many people at the edges and so much interactivity and so much complexity that you can't really uh, just follow a single user or a single workflow through. And that perhaps if we ha were paying more attention to things like that, stuff like election tampering would have been harder to do. So closing down uh, or co coming to a conclusion here, um, this is the life expectancy is plotted on the vertical axis here, life expectancy. And uh, along the bottom, you have income. Uh, it's, uh, it's per person GDP. And so you can like let it run a couple times, right? But I think most of us grew up in school with an idea of the West and the rest and an idea that elsewhere in the world, people have shorter life expectancies, more children, and are poorer and that there is kind of this zero-sum game between them getting something and us losing something here. But if you look at the statistics, this is all open data UN statistics uh, from a wonderful website called gapminder.org uh, and has a, also a TED talk from Hans Rosling if you would like to watch it, it's superb. Um, but Overall, if you look at uh, really what the data tells us, there is not such a scarcity problem as we think. People overall are significantly better off on average uh, now than they would have been if they were born 50 years or 100 years ago. Collectively, the world is getting better for most people. And that doesn't mean that there's not areas where women are oppressed or children can't go to school or terrorism is a threat, um, but it does mean that for most people, uh, they're going to be happier than they were previously. And maybe we need to stop thinking of it as such a zero-sum game. So we're just getting started. When I was a kid, I really wanted to be like a lab coat type scientist person, but uh, I was starting with math and, and going into algebra, and I thought like, if I'm starting here, how can I ever possibly contribute something new? I have to learn everything in the world first. Like, how do you possibly get there? But it turns out people are coming up with new stuff all the time, and it's not such a straight line, right? We stand on the shoulders of giants. So every year, outside of our tiny little myopic vision, uh, there are amazing discoveries, and the world is doing things that can make it better. Uh, I mean, HIV prophylaxis, like a vaccine or preventative uh, drugs for HIV, 
30 years ago, this was this would have been, I mean, this, this is a this plague that was killing people, right? Imagine um, how important that would have been for people to hear then. Uh, or the efficiencies of solar power getting better, or swarms of uh, nanorobots, or finding Earth-like habitable planets elsewhere, or testing the viability of deep space manned travel. I mean, these things are absolutely amazing. And it's very easy, uh, especially in the space that we're in, to get bogged down an idea of uh, crypto balkanization, which I've talked about a lot, the, the geostate political landscape being laid on top of our technical networks such that it's difficult to connect even across protocols, right? You cannot have end-to-end -end encrypted uh, communications between the US and Russia. They use different underlying cryptographic protocols, right? Um, and so you can't do business with these people in the same way. It's easy to think that that kind of balkanization uh, means that we're necessarily leading towards additional types of kinetic war. And certainly, the news every day looks absolutely terrible. Right? But as we are designing these systems, I think the work that we are doing um, and that this community is doing has an outsized impact on the trajectory of politics, technology, and social change in the same way that those working groups in the 70s were. Right? Like, never doubt that attending a single working group meeting can change the world. Um, I like to tell myself that before I have to dial into all of these IETF meetings. Um, <laughs> but, we have to, it's an amazing time, and this, this work is happening in all these other fields. There are advancements across genetics and quantum research and, uh, and, and medical research, et cetera, that is just like stunning humanity altering work. And there are lots of reasons to believe that we can all be better off and that my winning does not necessarily mean you're losing. And so in the end, we do not necessarily all have to be so angry. Thank you. What an amazing talk to end the day on. Uh, do you guys have any questions for Amber? Or are we all ready to party? My job is to just give you something to talk about over beers. So, <laughs> right. tiny one. OK. Um, quick couple of quick notes. We have a women's networking event happening at Mead Hall at 5.30. Uh, and there is an after party happening at 10 PM. So exciting. Uh, but don't forget, tonight's daylight savings. So please make sure your clocks are synced. Otherwise, you'll miss tomorrow's first talk, which is going to be a debate on permission versus permissionless, which is an exciting debate, I assume. Uh, also, uh, tomorrow, we will be raffling the three products that we talked about before. So make sure you're around. You might get lucky. And thank you so much for attending. This was a great day, and hope to see you tomorrow at 9 a.m. Thank you.